After removing the terracotta tiles, we reveal this under roof, a board roof. Um, it's a hundred years old, so it obviously isn't in the greatest condition. I should think there's about 30% complete, um, complete damage. Quite a lot of it is still perfectly usable and watertight, but to get this back to being watertight and not rely on anything else would need a fair bit of repair. Um, quite a few boards would have to be removed, probably 30-40%. And anyway, this has been uh, already agreed that we're going to use uh, bitumen paper with uh, an under roof made of wood on top of this. So it preserves the old without really having to do anything much more than just clean it off. But the roof is also quite weak. It has had its um, principal rafter cut over for the new, for the addition of the chimney. So I've taken this piece of timber that we cut down, one of the that first piece of timber that wasn't really good enough to use as a as a, a, a base stock, a bottom stock. Um, it's perfectly okay to use it to strengthen the roof construction. So after lifting it up like this, getting it in through the opened roof. Um, I make a kind of truss. I don't know if that's really the right word. I'm just winging it a bit here. I'm not really sure the names of these things. It's a kind of strengthened beam with um, some triangulation on it. And that spreads its load down onto the uh, the, the two large pieces of timber which are going to use, be used to strengthen the walls. don't know if you remember but there were no pegs in the walls which makes it much weaker than it should be. So that now carries the those two outside beams and those two outside beams carry the one in the middle. So it really is an enormous um, strength improvement on that part of roof. And this is another water damaged area so I'm just going to quickly change these pieces of timber. This is where the camera is not working very well at all so there are a lot of... Um, yeah it's going to jump around a bit now I'm afraid. Right that's the worst bit gone. i do another cut here just to take off. Oh there we go I've decided to stop there you have to stop at some point. There's no point in being too fastidious about it because really the rot doesn't continue as long as it has the structural integrity enough to hold up the roof above it. Rot doesn't continue if it doesn't have any water. So now I'm going to put together, like I did in the first two films, two pieces of timber with this kind of uh, union, this kind of joint here. If any of you know the names of these in English that would be very helpful for everybody, if um, me included, if um, you could tell me what these parts are called in the comments. I'm not even sure I know what they're called in Norwegian actually, I'm not very good on naming things. Uh, I might, I might have just forgotten what they're called anyway. It's the same here. There's a really not an enormous need to 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 get completely uh, back to fresh timber because up in the very top of the building like this, it just doesn't ever get wet as long as the roof is waterproof. Clips are getting shorter and shorter. But essentially it's the same process as if you've seen in the other films, you know, making a new top there and copying the old. That's a quick shot of inside the luft or inside the cogging. This is all done quite quickly just with an axe. I don't 
see the need to do this desperately um, accurately because really it just has to be the same quality as what was there already. It's going to be a vast improvement in strength in this top section and because of the lack of water coming into it now it's not going to deteriorate any further. So I can even use the pieces of timber that aren't the highest quality here as well. This is really a little bit on the short side, this piece of timber. I can only go down about a centimetre really, but I'm going to have to do more than that, unfortunately. Smallest amount, my um, measure seven. Uh, the important thing here is that at no point is it higher than 1.7. The uh, piece of timber down low enough to close the gap. And this bit at the back here has to be flat. All of the heads on the outside of this building have this air gap between them. It makes the heads last longer. Do anything at the other end because that's okay. Well, that's quite good there. Building buildings normally you want to aim for that to be about eight centimeters wide. That uh, the dip in the timber there, but so the idea with this is you keep this thing vertical through the x and the y axis. Mustn't be too sharp. Should be blunt, really. Kind of like a, like a. Actually, I was taught that it should be like about the sharpness of a ballpoint pen. That gives you a clear mark, and it follows the contours of the stock underneath rather than. to get wedged under either. It doesn't matter if this angle changes as long as that doesn't change and uh, that must be vertical. Horizontal here, vertical there. But that doesn't matter. You can have as far in and out as you want that way. side here so that I can do the line scribing both sides, that's very important. I'm going to have to do the rest from the inside so as Traditionally this thing that I'm doing here was done just with a small axe. Some people use a circle saw even for doing this, but that only really works when the timber has been power planed. This handmade process, I find this uh, combination of tools and technique to be uh, the fastest and most accurate. I don't want to go too deep into the timber, that's a mistake. A lot of modern um, timber house builders cut very deep into the timber at that point and you mustn't do that because you risk making the timber very weak for taking a load and it can literally split because of the weight from above. So I want a nice cup shape which is slightly more acute than the actual size of the piece of timber it's going down onto. I have a chance here to try and make a comparison between these two tools, the new one that I got in the spring and my old one. I did a lot of explanation while I was doing this but the um, camera was not working very well and there's so much damage to the audio continuity that uh, it doesn't make sense. So 
So I'm talking a little bit about working against the grain that you shouldn't really work against the grain but of course you do work against the grain and there's plenty of wood that can be taken away before it becomes a problem and if it does start to split out across the line like in that particular stroke there if you just go back and leave it you can either glue it or you can just leave it and it will actually close up as long as you don't cut the split off so I work as far as I can from that direction before turning around and I'll go back the other way later on because as I've said many times before, the direction of the anatomy of the of the fibres changes very often one side of the centre and the other. Which means you have to cut from both directions in any case. Notice the scoop is shallow and that's important. You just want to have a small air gap between the two pieces of timber and the top timber rests down just on the points. That gives you a good airtight seal. There was just some discussion when I was first learning to do this back in the 90s about cutting a line inside the timber stock there. I mean, this is now upside down, of course. So, But the idea was is that you cut a shallow, um, like a dado, I suppose, with a chainsaw down about a third of the way into the timber stock and that would mean that the air would get into the middle and dry the timber evenly all the way around so that it wouldn't split as much on the edges which was for aesthetic reasons but the findings I think generally speaking people have stopped doing that now because uh, some timber has actually split out just from having the weight above it that weakening cut in the middle was just too much for it so it so it, it split so i don't do i don't do that i think that the the splits that you get in the side of the pieces of timber in a timber house they're just part of it i don't think anybody really thinks about them in the building and the more there are the less you think about them it would be ob more obvious if there was just one <laughs> uh, but when every stock has them you don't really think about it If you have to start cutting pieces of timber into pieces in order to get them to be inside inside the wall without splitting and stuff, you're kind of losing the what is the genius of this system. And you might as well use other systems completely if you're not going to keep it simple. It just would be too complicated. The beauty of this system is it doesn't really take very much effort to, to make a wall that lasts hundreds of years just out of a raw material that there's quite a lot of in this area. So I subscribe to that that ethos of just keeping it simple and I'll use the power tools where they're sensible to use but the, use the hand tools when where they're sensible to use as well and you do have to have some practice to use the hand tools well but that's the same with any tools whether they're power or hand tools. And in this day and age, a lot of people specialise very, very much in one particular thing, and so they get very good at it. Um, you know, although I'm kind of specialised in restoring old buildings, I do so many different things at work every day there that uh, it isn't really that easy to stay in complete practice and get very masterful with all of these hand and power tool applications. And also, you have a limited working life really because it's very hard on the body i'm getting a bit old for this job really because it's um, you start to get arthritis and rheumatism and back problems and not to mention all of the kind of fumes and dust and everything so lack of loss of hearing it's uh, easy to romanticize this work for people that sit on youtube maybe but uh, it's actually quite hard work and it's quite heavy on quite demanding uh, on, a, on the body. So I turn it over and uh, out of shot there I'm just trying to get it over those beams that are in the wall that go into the wall. 
the joists that hold up the ceiling. And then I'm going to have to cut through the head there once. Now you might wonder why the head for the other laughter stock isn't there. Um, it makes sense when you're working with a piece of timber to a very fixed height to put the laughter head in second. This is just a thing that happens in restoration. You wouldn't do it with a new building. I'll aim for it to be um, tight at the on the inside. It's a bit of gap there in case it goes down. Using up these uh, leftover timbers from the different felling that I've been doing is a, a good thing but it me meant that these timbers were a little bit short really for the repair and uh, I make compound that problem by then cutting here when I should have left that piece longer and it's supposed to actually reach out to the uh, board there that's sticking out in free space. It really helped to stiffen up. Uh, Drilling with these large spiral augers is quite hard work and there's a innate problem in doing it because the chippings that are produced or could we call it swarf invariably jam the uh, machine especially when you've got through the first piece of timber and you're going into the second because the chippings go out into the um, space between the two and really lock it all up so you have to pull out the machine as you're working to empty out all of those chippings continuously uh, to avoid that and this machine has a clutch on it so it will actually stop if it gets too uh, too heavy which is a good thing I think because if the machines are too strong they just spin you around in circles up on the scaffolding and that is actually quite dangerous I've been thrown off the scaffolding once by a heavier duty machine than this so I don't like to use anything more powerful than this one I'm using here You'd have to do this uh, emptying of the chippings in any case, whether you were using a more powerful machine or not. overheated so I'll just let that cool down a bit. These pegs are usually a little bit smaller than I'm making them just now for this repair because you don't want the house to hang on them you want them to be able to slip down you should just put, be able to push them in with hand power but for a repair it's okay for them to be tight like this
the footage of the rest of these roof repairs is so badly damaged that there's really not much to salvage. So I'm going to have to refer you to some of my other videos that can show you how you might go about doing a, a wooden roof, um, which uh, you can see on the post and beam films that I've made. Uh, it's the same principle for this roof, it's just that uh, that was a wooden roof and this one has a terracotta, so it's just that last battening and using the terracotta tiles detail that's different. I'm just going to show some last images of the final product. The repairs at the bottom there have had a few months with the weight of the house and a little bit of snow and everything so they've tightened up like nicely which is the beauty of this um, kind of cogging it's called the Raulandsluft it's a particular shape of um, cogging that I think it might be unique to Norway I'm, I'm not really sure the Swedish ones that I've seen are certainly different and Finnish lufting is certainly very different um, it uh, has these sloping surfaces, these cheeks, so it allows the timber to kind of s tighten down onto them as it dries. So it stays airtight and waterproof even as the timber dries. There we go, that bottom stock's been out and back in again. That looks all right again. It was always slightly twisted before I started. Uh, This stone wall actually isn't really quite in the right place because the whole house has moved 20 centimetres towards the east, you know, that would say to in the other direction, away from what we're seeing now. So it has a slight unconventional look, but there really wasn't any more money in the budget to um, to do anything about that. That would either entail moving the whole house, taking down the chimney completely, or making or lifting up the whole house and making a new foundation underneath and that just really doesn't stand in relation to the kind of building this is and its life and its use. This is uh, a repair and um, it is completely intact with what is normal for repairing farm buildings and kind of acceptable from an historian, historical point of view. I've straightened up the door frame so the door works properly now it was scuffing against the floor before and we can have a look inside the floor was a separate entity it has its own foundation stones and is not connected to the walls and this building was never meant as an interior um, heated winter dwelling or something I mean the the timber came from an old house so that that was water, uh, airtight but this has always been just a rough kitchen. That standing post there stiffens the wall but also supports the new truss that goes into the attic that supports the, the roof where the roof had been weakened. There's the truss with its threaded rod bars which are under a lot of tension. They are tightened up to pre-stress the structure with a slight curve in it so that it supports the the purlins. When this house was built a hundred years ago it was using recycled timber that came from a dwelling that had already existed perhaps a hundred or maybe two hundred years before that and with these repairs we should hope for at least another hundred years service life from this building and um, I would like to thank very much the owners for putting their faith in my work and deciding to put their faith in this building. And I would like to thank the Patreons for financially supporting the making of these films, which is very much appreciated. And of course the subscribers and the people that comment and people who come back to the channel time after time and watch this content from the Scandinavian building site, Restoring Old Houses. Welcome back next time. Bye bye.